And you calibrate and you recalibrate and you disengage and you re-engage and you adjust and you pivot and you adapt and all those things. But when you focus on that process, you remove the pressures associated with the outcome. And I think that's really important for people because a lot of us either self-sabotage, we get in our own way, we are complicit in our own actions of where we're at today. And because of the goals that we set in January 1st and not hitting them, now we're in September, we almost forgot about that and how important that goal was to us January 1st. We made that New Year's resolution. Same thing goes for the Olympic space. So process over prize, incredibly important. And I think it not only alleviates the pressure and stress associated with the outcome, it also allows you to truly focus and say, look, there's some things that I simply don't have control over. Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to a special Winter Olympics Encore edition of Crazy Money. This here episode is the one I recorded with U.S. speed skater Apollo Ono back in September 2020. Ah, we were so young back then. We didn't know what life was going to hand us. But anyway, it's a great conversation I had with Apollo. He and I go deep into the economic realities of becoming an Olympian and then being an Olympian and then reinventing yourself after you are done being an Olympian. A lot of people don't know, but due to the steep cost of coaching, training, equipment, and travel, many, probably most Olympic athletes and their families go deep into debt in pursuit of a spot on the national team. And even for the few that make it and the even fewer who end up winning a medal, There is little preparation for post-game remuneration and little preparation for a job in the real world that is waiting for them when their Olympic time is over. Let's talk about Apollo. With eight Olympic medals, two of them gold, Apollo Ono is America's most decorated winter Olympian. He won his first major speed skating title at the tender age of 14 after only six months of training. He continued on to a career that played a major role in establishing short track speed skating in the 2002, 2006, and 2010 Winter Games. In his post-skating career, Apollo has worked as a sports analyst for NBC, a global ambassador for the Olympics, and a winner of the ABC hit show Dancing with the Stars. He finished the 2014 Ironman World Champion Triathlon in less than 10 hours. Ouch! Apollo now spends much of his time speaking to business and nonprofit leaders around the globe, His New York Times bestselling memoir, Zero Regrets, tells the story of success, setbacks, and what it takes to become one of the top athletes in the world. His next book, Hard Pivot, which tells the story of reinvention and tackling new challenges while maintaining his iconic positive attitude and unmatched energy, comes out later this month. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Apollo Ono. Apollo Ono, welcome to Crazy Money. Thanks for having me. So, Apollo, to the average person watching the winter or summer games on TV, being an Olympian looks like a pretty glamorous life. They're young, they're beautiful, they're doing things with their bodies most people cannot comprehend. Is that an accurate picture of what's really going on? Well, I think that's the accurate picture when we open the curtain. As with any journey in anyone's life, I think that you know when you peel back the layers and you start to see the texture associated with that journey, there's much more there than what's on the surface. So, you know, when we are presented to the world once every four years, I think we on the surface level understand the level of dedication and time and energy and blood, sweat and tears that went into this spectacular performance that perhaps only lasted 40 seconds or one minute long, but we fail to really truly see, because how could we understand the life that is lived by a lot of these athletes? But I think regardless of that statement, I do believe that there is some truth to it, right? I mean, you've got these athletes, I mean, they're literally operating at the highest end of, I think, the DNA gene pool lottery for many of them. And they've been priming their minds and bodies for, you know, sometimes upwards of over a decade for this one moment. So we do get to see them you know, opening the curtain and now you're on for the world's, if you can perform on that day, then we hoist them up even higher. And they stand on those pedestals and we look to them as superheroes. But I think behind every superhero is a tremendous story of that is challenging and trials and triumph. Okay. So I'm 51 years old. I don't want to close all windows, but let's say it's pretty much assured that my chances of winning an Olympic medal are pretty much over unless chess comes into play or something like that. (laughs) So I want to think about this through the lens of a parent's viewpoint, right? The price that somebody might pay. Let's say I'm a regular working guy and I have a daughter who is 10 years old or she's eight or she's 12 and she's an athletic prodigy. Like you say, she's won the genetic gene pool there. 
Say she's a prodigy at figure skating. What kind of financial and lifestyle commitment does it take for me to help her find out how good she can be? Interesting. Well, figure skating, from my knowledge, is on the upper echelon of the more expensive sports because you're essentially renting ice time. You're renting coaches time. You've got to get up at these ungodly hours of like three, four in the morning to drive to the ice rink because typically the figure skaters train before the team practices are. So if it's a hockey team or a speed skating team or someone else, they'll take those individual lessons and training sessions before. So the commitment level from the family has to be pretty intense. I've seen families move from one state to another simply so that their daughter or son can pursue that particular sport in the environment that's required. And in terms of the actual financial, in terms of numbers, you know, I'm not sure about figure skating, but I know that you know, on average, I think Olympic athletes are in debt anywhere from twelve to $30,000 a year in pursuit of their dream. And predominantly, the majority of that, Paul, is really the following. You know, we're subsidized by the U.S. Olympic Committee. So the U.S. OPC, which is the United States Olympic and Paralympic Committee, their main job and purpose is to essentially provide the services and tools and access to the resources for the athletes when they go and pursue their dream. And that is done through donation and it's also done through large scale sponsorships. So think of anyone who is in kind of the Fortune 1000, these large scale organizations, they typically have a hand in the Olympic space in some degree. And then that money then gets trickled down through the NGBs, which is the national governing body. So USA figure skating, USA track and field, USA cycling, USA wrestling, USA speed skating, et cetera, et cetera. And then from there, those monies are essentially diverted into, you know, head coach, coaching, executive director, program director, et cetera. And then you join this team if you're a part of the Olympic training program or the national team training program. And then those costs of having a coach are subsidized. Now, what is not subsidized and what does require out of pocket is all of the additional expenses associated with pursuing your dream. So, you know, you're given kind of this template to go and perform. It's like the team workout, it's the team atmosphere. But if you truly want to kind of stand above and beyond the shoulders, I think, or you're an individual sport like figure skating, a lot of those things are coming out of pocket. And those coaching expenses are expensive because you're not just hiring a per hour basis, you're hiring them for four years, essentially. So think of someone who's a highly trained coach and is only coaching two people, the premiums start to get pretty aggressive in association with all of the equipment, sometimes the travel And the list goes on and on. And I think that because the sport is not in the, quote, professional realm, because it's still considered amateur, and because we are still Olympic athletes, there's no salary associated. It's not subsidized by the government. There's no team stipends, et cetera, et cetera. These are kind of bare bones of what's required to go and train and win medals at the games. So look, most athletes know this going into the game. It's not like we go into the world of the Olympic realm thinking we're going to become fabulously wealthy and live this incredible, glamorous life. Although I think there is a misconception associated with after you win a medal, what the next steps will happen and the opportunities that will potentially pop up and arise because of that. For example, you know, when I won my first medal, I was asked to be on the cover of a Wheaties box. Now, for me, that was phenomenal. It was like a childhood dream. I knew nothing about Wheaties. I never ate Wheaties. But it was amazing. And it was it was incredible. I thought it was something that I always wanted to have. And I thought that's like when you can say, dude, I made it. I'm on the cover of a Wheaties box, right? And I thought that was like a million dollar contract. You know, I'm not even sure if I can say this, but let's just say it it was less than thirty thousand dollars to be on that Wheaties box for a year. Yeah. And so if you're in debt for a full year, you had just won a gold medal. I think the numbers don't exactly correlate with what your personal expectation, I think what society would expect in the same time. So it's an interesting journey, man. It's not one that's really talked about much. I think a lot of people are actually surprised to hear that we're not paid to be a part of the Olympic team or we're not paid to, in some level, like you know, an NBA athlete or a football star who's getting millions of dollars in a contract. I mean, those things don't even exist in our world. There's not even any kind of semblance of a conversation. But I'm guessing you got a lot of free cereal. Is that true? <laughs> Not Actually, that- I did. I did. And then I became a, then I, and then I was a serial connoisseur. Then you got celiac disease and you had to stop. Yeah. Eating. <laughs> 
So you said anywhere from ten to thirty thousand dollars a year, and that can depend on what sport you're in. So how do these family? And by the way, and you also mentioned the help from the U.S. Olympic and Paralympic Committee, but that doesn't start until you've already reached a certain level that you don't get to without dedicating years and tens of thousands of dollars to even have a shot at it, right? Yeah, that's right. So I think that none of those resources are actually available to you as an athlete until you make the quote national team. And when you're officially a part of the national team, which means you're in the national training program, you have access to the national team program director, the national team coach, the resources. If you have the chance to go live inside of an Olympic training center, which imagine like a very small college dorm campus that is just housing Olympic athletes. And so there's a cafeteria, there's, you know, weight room, sauna, there's the dorm rooms, kind of everything you have. And it's all Olympic athletes. No one's studying school. You know, some guys are, but most are just studying their sport. So it takes time, you know? I mean, I think with every athlete who is, you know, pursuing the Olympic dream, you know, the resources just aren't available until you make that national team level. And then when you do, there's, don't get me wrong, there's still a substantial amount of resources that is there for the athletes to provide for them. And there's the huge team behind these athletes that, that is never shown on the screen when you see their stories and you see them on the podium. I mean, the teams and the amount of people that's required to make an Olympic athlete are enormous, enormous. So suffice to say that nobody is making it to the Olympics without putting in eight to 12 years of rigorous training and investment, which at, you know, 30 grand a year, even conservatively 20 grand a year is $200,000 invested, not to mention lost wages, sacrifices they made in terms of skipping school or not going as deep into school and not preparing themselves for the corporate career on the other side of this thing. So how do these athletes' families do it and how do they rationalize it? That's a great question. So I can only speak from my experience. And, you know, my experience was such that, you know, I was raised in a single parent household and my father thought that this was a really unique opportunity for me to go and do something extraordinary. And at whatever cost, he was going to try to support that and push me in that direction because it was able to be, I think, focused in a way in terms of my attention and energy that was positive. And he thought the life lessons associated with that would give me far beyond what I could perform in sport. And so I think that when you think about this commitment and this idea, I don't think any family is really thinking about the financial implications associated, right? There's many athletes who struggle throughout the process. But I just know that it's not about the money. That's when it comes down to. It's never been about the money for these athletes. And I think as we become a more commercialized society, and when you monetize every inch and ounce of your being, your brand, your social, et cetera, the conversation starts to change. And then athletes now are starting to really have the decision of, well, how long is my career in sport? And then when do I actually, and should I retire and pursue something else? What other facets of my personality, drives, and interests do I have that are important to me and that I have skill sets that I think are transferable across any career path? What are those things? I think that conversation is starting to happen earlier. I can tell you that in my era from like 1996 until 2010, we didn't have those conversations. It was just like jumping out of a plane with no parachute trying to land on a target. If you land on the target, you're safe. If you don't, you're dead. That was kind of like the do or die attitude that we have and we had. But I think the conversation is different now. I think the athletes are because of the access to information. But like you said, it's still a financial commitment and it still requires a tremendous amount of dedication and support from not only yourself, but your family and your team. I think what is interesting is, you know, I've always felt that because we were pursuing this particular dream, the days that when you didn't win, they should actually be pretty painful. Like, you know, if you're doing this full time, like you should take this pretty personally if you're not getting the results that you required. So I was always very taken aback by when I would see athletes just not take it as seriously as perhaps I was. And I think maybe that's not fair because I was living in this really hyper obsessive world that perhaps was not the most healthy psychologically. But for me, you know, I just felt like, man, how can you be okay losing considering the opportunity cost associated with what we're doing. I mean, the fact that you're living a life that has a very short window, everything and every day matters. So I think that's hard to describe to someone when they're going through the experience, right? Because like anything, you don't know what it is until someone takes it away and then you start screaming. That's what happens to a lot of athletes when they retire. Man, they, like, they look back on the career and say, man, I miss that so much. I don't care that there was no money. I don't care that it was a struggle just the kind of consistent, passionate pursuit of excellence on a daily basis was so 
fulfilling and rewarding to me that nothing can replace that. And now, you know, they're struggling to find their own identity outside of sport. So I don't know, just, just some thoughts on that. It's interesting. You make the point in this new HBO documentary, The Weight of Gold, which I talked about in the introduction of this interview, and I highly recommend for everybody to watch, that the difference between gold and no metal is like a second or, <laughs> or two seconds sometimes. And that's yeah. after 10 or 15 or even 20 years of training. So like the difference is hardly even recognizable, and yet it's the reflection of 10 years of just ridiculous discipline and hard work. You describe your diet in your memoir, No Regrets. It's like, I mean, you've calculated your caloric intake to the calorie every day while working out four or five times a day. And yet some of the people are sitting there not only dealing with the athletic necessities and requirements, they're also sitting there trying to figure out how they're going to eat next month. <laughs> Lolo Jones talks in the documentary about making smoothies at a gym and people are watching some Olympic qualifier or a U.S. champion event over her shoulder that she's running in, there's this huge disconnect. Like, how do you process the ever-present subtext of financial stress while you're trying to be the absolute best in the world, the margin of which is infinitesimal? Well, you, we, you said that much better than I could ever possibly describe it and articulate. I'm not sure I the, pronounced infinitesimal correctly, but, but <laughs> let me slide on that one. Look, quite simply, the athletes who are doing well are more financially incentivized to continue doing well than those who are not. And this is how skewed it is. When you are struggling as an athlete, if you are not getting results, you don't have access to additional resources. You don't get paid additional kind of bonuses per prize money, et cetera, which by the way, are quite small in some of the more obscure. What do you win for getting a gold medal? I read this this morning and it was not huge. You know, back then it was between fifteen and twenty five thousand, I believe, that you would get for winning gold. So Which is you know, nice, a but a fraction nice. of what you've put into it, right? And you pay taxes on that. So if you're a California oh, resident, you know, let's just cut that in <laughs> half, right? Just call it you bring home ten grand. Look, the financial metrics don't equate to the time and energy that's put in. And I would be the first to argue to say if you compare the rigorousness and the focal point of what the athletes do on a daily basis in the Olympic realm compared with the professional realm, there's no comparison. The Olympic realm is just, it operates at a different level of commitment. And I only know that because I've got a lot of friends and I'm not throwing shade at anyone in the professional realm because those mm -hmm. guys are superhuman, incredible, and I've got so much respect for them. But I'm just talking purely from an obsessive point of view. I just haven't seen the same level, and I'm generalizing, of course, across the board where there is no off season. The off season is conducted in the hills of Colorado Springs doing mountain training with 45 pound weight vests, jumping up a mountain. Like that's your off season. You know, your Christmas day is spent at Colorado college doing low walks, which is like a simulation of being in the skating position where your knees drag on the ground. You're hunched over in this position while it's like two degrees outside. So an athlete prepares his or her entire life for a moment that lasts, like you said, you know, just a couple of seconds. And if you're a track and field sprinter, if you're an Usain Bolt, it's less than 10 seconds. You have to be absolutely perfect on that day. And there's so many millions of variables that could potentially change the trajectory of your career in that moment, in that time frame. So, but that's also, Paul, that's why we love the sports. That's why we love the Olympics is because of what that is, because of what that represents, because we know that this person has dedicated their entire life or a young adult life towards this one moment in which they need to be absolutely perfect. And in that perfect realm, they are trying to show themselves what the best they can be. And so we see that. We see them at their absolute peak physically and mentally. And we fall in love with those stories accordingly. And it's beautiful. It's powerful. You know, I don't know. Someone asked me their day and they said, Paula, let's say that you could 100x your financial metric associated with your winnings and you're subsidizing all the costs associated with training. Would you and how would you perform differently? And I thought about that really hard and I was like, you know, that's interesting. I think some athletes would. I think money can sometimes cloud the judgment of both the long-term longevity of what the athlete is doing and also making decisions in and around the space. But I think at the end of the day, the, the reality is the Olympic realm and the sports that these athletes are training in, depending on which sport you're in, Okay, so if you're a track and field athlete, or if you're a volleyball player, or if you're one of these athletes who is in a kind of more widely celebrated and widely practiced sport, 
you will make money. You can make decent money swimming. For example, you can make a tremendous amount of money swimming speed skating. Like how many speed skaters do you know in your friends and family circle, Paul? Zero, probably zero besides me. Right. So just to give you an example, imagine luge or bobsled. <laughs> right, like these right. are very small sports and I love them. Like I love luge. I love bobsled, but there's no financial, like Nike's trying to think, well, how am I going to sell luge sneakers? or a luge outfit to the next remaining categories, right? So, you know, back in 2002, after I had won my first medal, I had a deal with Nike. It was very small, but Nike was really interested in trying to, this is kind of pre-CrossFit. They were saying, remember those commercials, Bo Don't Know? Oh yeah, for Um, sure. So they wanted to reinvigorate and reinvent that whole campaign, but using me as the moniker. And they wanted to say, Apollo, because you're a speed skater, we can't go sell speed skating gear. There's like less than 100,000 speed skaters in the United States, maybe like less than 200,000, right? Like that's just not the good metric for us, like a Tiger Woods or a Ronaldo or whoever, right, is sponsored or a Jordan brand. But what we can do is why don't we restart a new category of athlete and let's do the cross training realm. So this was when cross training was starting to pick back up. They wanted to essentially use me because speed skaters do tons and tons of cross training. And man, I tell you, Paul, it's just too bad this thing never happened. I had all this gear. We all like branded <laughs> stuff. I thought my life was going to change. And then boom, someone said, I don't know if we can make this happen. And then they pulled out. Well, and then I guess Reebok owns the CrossFit space now. Mm. But anyway, what I'm saying is, if you look at it from a purely objective and a sales point of view, when you are an athlete, unless you are providing value to that organization in some capacity beyond, and this is what I do full-time now is a lot of speaking engagements, a lot of consulting, a lot of mindset training workshops, according, and just trying to help people essentially unlock their own gold medal potential inside of them. But if you don't have that, and you're trying to hire an athlete or partner with an athlete long-term, you know, the organization is going to say, what's the ROI for us? Is it brand related? Is it getting access to using the rings? What does that do for our bottom line? So there's a lot of conversations, I think, that both the athletes and these corporations have to say, you know, transparently, like, what is the value add that the athlete can give over a long period of time, right? And sometimes that answer is not as clear as the athlete wants to be. They don't want to hear that, hey, if we sponsor you today, the rest of this year, we may not see a return on that money. So it's the cold, hard truth associated with sport versus a baseball or a basketball where You look at someone who is an incredible athlete, you look at like a Kevin Durant or something, and they know the ROI. They know that that guy can sell and resell tons of merchandise and sneakers and branding accordingly. He's on TV 84 nights a year, right? There you go. And that's the other value. These athletes are becoming beyond bigger than their own teams. They're becoming true brands and personal ambassadors of their own personality. And I think that people would argue and say like LeBron is almost bigger than the NBA sometimes Mm -hmm. because of what he stands for, both in his communities, for his team. It's fascinating. And so I think there's a lot to be learned from the professional realm in terms of how they conduct business, how they conduct themselves, the professionalism that exists within the realm of that sport. And maybe, maybe, you know, the Olympic sports can learn from that in a way. Maybe the IOC shouldn't be the kind of godfather making all the decisions as like the puppet master up top deciding on the futures and fate of where all these dollars are spent. I'm not sure. I do hear some parents talking about, you know, I want to get my daughters into golf because that's the most reliable way to get your child an athletic scholarship to college is if she's playing a sport that is in demand and doesn't have a large supply of athletes in that sport. Is that a smart way to think about where to direct your eight-year-old's energy? Well, I think that's tough. Anytime you got that type of a tiger mom or dad and you're pushing an athlete, unless the (laughs) the love and support is true and authentic, if the athlete's hating what they're doing, that's just a recipe for disaster. But I don't see anything wrong with that. I think sport can be a great catalyst. And don't get me wrong. I think that, you know, if you are preparing your daughter or your son for a potential full ride to a fantastic education process and path, that's great. Why not? Absolutely. I mean, it's not like education is getting cheaper in the US, even though everyone's going virtual. I think that sport itself can lend so much strength and life lessons for people. And I don't want to see that being lost in the realm of the digitization of what's happening around our experiences around the world. Because I just believe that when you, as an athlete, can learn the discipline, the scheduling, the hard work, the winning, the losing, the reinvention, the adapting, the going beyond what you thought was possible 
the long-term goal setting, the commitment, all these things that are required, I think, to have a successful and fruitful life post-career. At the time of the Olympic pursuit or the sporting career, you don't recognize how powerful these lessons are. But when you retire, many years later, you'll say, wow, those things are exactly what I would want to have on my team in this organization or those attributes and skill sets. Those are the things that I feel like I can't train them. They take long periods of time in order to become adopted as normal behaviors. So yeah, money is important. Yes, scholarships are important, but don't lose sight of the fundamental characteristics that build sport and why we watch sport because that's what we fall in love with. All right, let's use your journey as a demonstration of some of these principles. Going back to what we were talking about raising your kids, did you choose speed skating or did it choose you? That's a great question. So I would say that I chose speed skating, but it was mainly because I didn't like swimming. And, <laughs> which you were extremely um, good at, right? I was, I was yeah, I was, I was a decent swimmer. I was a state champion in Washington State, naturally gifted. Wasn't the tallest of kids, but still, I don't know if it, maybe it was the buoyancy of me being so chunky, I could just float better. <laughs> um, something, something there was working. And I wanted to actually play football and box, and my dad said no to both. So those were out. And I think for good reason, and that's probably, you know, there's no way that I could have probably ever succeeded in those sports the same way I did in sports. So in speed skating, I saw the sport when I was 12. I started training, I guess, officially when I was 14. And I made my first team when I was 14 years old. So if I said that I chose a sport, I think that it was this decision that my father saw that I had a unique talent and skill set for. He was so aggressive and pushed me towards that in a way that I don't think that any other parent would probably deem to be appropriate in today's standards. Like my dad was very, very tiger father and he really pushed me and I fell in love with the sport. I really loved it and I loved what I was doing, but I wouldn't say that sport chose me. I would say that sport saved me is probably the correct terminology there. It it really saved me from a potential, you know, negative life of getting involved with the wrong group of kids growing up, going down the wrong path, being too mischievous, whatever that is. I think that the sport was that catalyst that taught me about how to pursue something all out and pursue something with a zero regrets philosophy, regardless of whether I make mistakes or not. So I'm just very grateful of that. Your dad played a giant role in your life. And I guess all our dads do, hopefully. What kind of work did he do? You know, my dad is so interesting. He's an individual who, you know, my dad came from Japan to this country when he was only 17 years old. And he didn't speak a word of English. He didn't have any money, really grinded his way just to figure it out. And I think through that hardcore and work ethic is what I saw when I was growing up in this single parent household. My dad was also interesting because he very much appreciated and embodied the Americana culture, especially then. And he would still dream in Japanese. He still counts in Japanese. You know, my dad is an immigrant. So he came to this country And he's got this unique blend of this like Japanese philosophical view mixed with this Americana belief and cultural value system, like combined, which is really interesting, right? You've got this Eastern philosophical view. And so my dad just, he showed me and he taught me at an early age and he told me there's nothing that you cannot do when you really, really want to do something. Now, obviously there's some limitations accordingly. Like I wasn't going to go play in the NBA or the NFL, but I think he was just more trying to you know, inject into my brain that when you truly commit yourself and you follow that process versus the prize, you will have success in some degree. And even to this day, I'll ask my dad a question and typically he responds back, not with like a yes or no. It's like this long philosophical haiku that I have to then unravel and decipher. (laughs) To call you grasshopper. This is unbelievable. And my dad is very in tune with nature. He's somehow always been right in my life even when I feel that he's completely wrong in a particular opinion or view on something. And then a year later, it turns out to be completely accurate. So my father has been, I guess, my grounding phase. He's been that individual who's been a teammate, a mentor, a father, a friend, and an educator. Because I just look at, while my father is not an incredible businessman, I think that the values that he has and he stands for. By the way, my dad lives in the Seattle, Washington area. And he has had the same hair salon. My dad started cutting hair when he was in college. And he's had that same hair salon for like 40 years or something, right? So my dad goes to work every single day, like six and seven days a week. Even during the pandemic, he was there. Even though he wasn't allowed to open, he would just go there and just clean. You know, you could imagine when you see a father that committed and dedicated towards work 
And then I used to ask him, I was like, why don't you just retire? It's not like you're like making a lot of money doing this. And his answer was like, retire for what? Like, this is what I'm supposed to be doing. As long as I can see, hear, and feel, I feel like it's my duty to come and be a part of this community and give back in a way. Because if you could imagine, if you've been cutting someone's hair for 30 years, you're basically their psychologist, right? You hear all their problems. I mean, the, you know, I think all the barbers and hair salon people, if you've cut someone's hair for long enough, you pretty much know a lot about their life. You know, my dad has been that. He served as like the community ear to a lot of families and people. And I think that he derives a lot of pleasure out of that, regardless of the fact that whether he has true financial success, I think his success comes from the fact that he thinks that he's providing true purpose and value. And I derive from that my own realm. While I'm financially motivated in a totally different perspective than my father, I also have that fundamental layer of what is my purpose? What is my mission? What is the next stage of my life going to look like? And how can I do the right things in order to enrich people's lives so that they themselves can go and win, so that they can win more consistently and they can have less pain and more fulfillment? So that's what my dad taught me. Paul is, and he teaches me all the time. So I'm grateful just to have a father who was just so insightful. Yeah, your dad sounds like a total badass in the book. You know, cutting hair in the 80s, very groovy, found his way in a brand new country. What a cool story. You talked about training and the focus on process versus outcomes. How did that mentality help you as an Olympian and as you transitioned into your post-Olympic career? My first fear that was front and center during training was a deep sense and a fear of failure. Failure that I would show up and it wasn't good enough, show up and I was less than. And I'm sure that there's probably some micro trauma that goes probably way back to the separation of my dad and my mom that had been ingrained in my psyche, which is also probably why I was so obsessive about preparing so well so I could eliminate the risk of that happening mm -hmm. as much as possible. So the process over prize psychology started from that, it started from the fact that I had so much, when I say that I was so insecure and so deeply afraid of failing, I mean, I approach training in a psychotic fashion. I got yeah. cramps just reading about it. Just completely like a possessed madman. And if you ask my teammates, they will say that. These are not my words. And I look back and I kind of shake my head after all these years of doing like deep personal work and being like, man, like I was in a very interesting place in my life during that time. And I don't think that I could replicate that today had it been skewed a different perspective. So the process over prize is, I can't control the outcome. Like in reality, you run the same race four different times, Paul, in a 500 meters men's final. You're going to get four different winners, maybe three different winners. Maybe one guy won twice or something, okay? But in reality, think about that. So your ability to control the controllables and only focus on what is important, and that is the process. No one's focusing on, I got to get gold. I need to get gold. I need to win this race. I need to do that. That's not going to get you anywhere. The only area that I felt was really, truly important was focusing on that process. What are the steps that I need to do for the next four years consistently that will put me in the best possible chance to reach the podium? And you calibrate and you recalibrate and you disengage and you re-engage and you adjust and you pivot and you adapt and all those things. But when you focus on that process, the chances of you, I don't want to say process in terms of mechanical, but there is some mechanics associated. You remove the pressures associated with the outcome. And I think that's really important for people because a lot of us either self-sabotage, we get in our own way, we are complicit in our own actions of where we're at today. And because of the goals that we set in January 1st and not hitting them, now we're in September, we almost forgot about that and how important that goal was to us in January 1st. We made that New Year's resolution. Same thing goes for the Olympic space. I would see teammates of mine set these huge audacious goals every year. And then three months into the training season, I see them reverting back to their normal self, back to the old human conditions and behaviors. And so I felt that if I had to make transformational change in my athletic career, it comes in the form of process. It doesn't come in the form of only focusing on the results. Now, using the metric is excellent, and I think that we need that, and that's the gauge that we all use to have our eyes on the bullseye, keep your eye on the ball. But in reality, that's merely just keeping you focused so you can see light at the end of the tunnel. But for you to truly prepare properly, you have to understand how to A, reverse engineer what that looks like, B, prepare for, I think, these unforeseen 
and uncertain circumstances that you will face because on the Olympic trials or on the Olympic final day, some NBC guy might be right in your face with that camera <laughs> and he may trip and fall and push you down or who knows? There's a thousand things that could potentially happen, right? Maybe the bus is late taking you from the Olympic village to the actual ice rink. And now you've only got a half an hour to warm up versus an hour. Like there's just thousands of stories of these things happening that are completely out of your control. What if you get sick the same day? What if your blades or your skates are a little bit off or the equipment has changed? There's so many things. You still got to perform. No one cares, unfortunately. Only people care about is the results on paper when they look back on this 10 years from now. So process over prize, incredibly important. And I think it not only alleviates the pressure and stress associated with the outcome, it also allows you to truly focus and say, look, there's some things that I simply don't have control over. But the things that I do, you better damn sure understand that I'm going to maximize my potential in those things that I can control. As I was reading about that, all the different things that happen and staying in control, it also occurred to me that you're a 19-year-old guy when you start to really hit your stride and get a lot of attention, win a lot, right. get a lot of media attention. And you're all about process, but you're also a 19-year-old guy. How are you not thinking about or getting distracted by supermodels and Benzes? Well, you are. You absolutely are getting distracted. <laughs> I mean, who the hell's not distracted by, by those things? I think at the end of the day, it's your ability to kind of become distracted, knowing that the distraction is real, and then just readjusting and saying, okay, but this is what's important right now. Mm. All that looks fun. And I had a lot of friends who were not athletes, and the life that they were living was totally different than mine. And there was envy sometimes. It was like, man, I want to just like go out and relax on a Saturday. But like I said before, Paul, like I had another voice in my head that didn't really allow for that complacency and call that my own curse at the same time. You know, it was a blessing and a curse. The blessing was that I never let up. I would go and win a world cup or a world championships. And then after the banquet, I would go back to my room instead of going out with a team and hanging out with all the other international competitors. I would go back to my room and watch the skating tapes of the competition. And I would analyze and I would take notes. I just won the competition. What the hell am I going to do? Like, I just smoked everybody. There's no reason for me to not go out and go hang out with everybody and, and build great camaraderie and relationships. But it's just driven in a different way. It just was unsatisfied and nothing was ever good enough. And so I think that that trickled down later on in my career where when I was young, I saw the bright lights. I saw the opportunities that existed in the entertainment realm of coming to you know, the after Oscar parties and seeing these actors that I had watched film after film in and them rushing up to me, telling me that how huge fans they were and me just like basically being starry eyed. I thought that the world was just a different place. And I also thought that everybody in the world also watched the Olympics, which is kind of funny thinking back. And it wasn't until later on in my career, I was like, oh my gosh, there's a huge population of people who don't watch the Olympics. That was when I went on Dancing with the Stars and like half people who were watching the show only remember me as the dancing guy, not as an Olympic athlete. And I was like, ah, oh, I get it. I get it. There's a different world out there that exists. So I think that the distraction is natural as long as you're able to readjust and bring it back to reality of, of what's important to you. Why did you title your memoir, No Regrets? So when I was writing the book, you know, subtitled Be Greater Than Yesterday, Zero Regrets, it wasn't that I was making a statement that I was saying that I have zero regrets because I think that's just an impossibility. However, I do like the philosophical view of pursuing a life of zero regrets. So in 2008 and 2009, I had done something that was very unique in the world of short track where I had changed the cadence, the body weight, the style, the physiology of me, of me as an athlete. And I did that by writing these little sticky post-it notes as reminders of these two words essentially just triggers that would remind me of why I was doing this insanity of training. When I thought that I wanted to stop and quit or that it was enough, I would say these words and it was very important for me to live them and embody them and feel them at the soul level. And those words were zero regrets. I wanted to have zero regrets when I arrived in Vancouver, BC in 2010 about all of the stones that I turned over to make sure that I was fully prepared in a way that I couldn't possibly imagine I could have done something more. And so that was a very hard conversation for me to have. But all year, that was the mantra. That was the saying, zero regrets. You want zero regrets. You cannot control the outcome of the races. But when you arrive, your goal is to have zero regrets about your preparation, about your path, and about this experience. 
And for a guy who was so obsessed with perfection, that was very hard to do. It was very, very hard to have that conversation, that question and answer with yourself. But over time, I think I got closer and closer. And so the idea was that the smallest of incremental improvements compounded over time will yield incredibly powerful results. And while we want huge jumps in performance today, I think we seek progress over perfection. And that was something that was also ingrained into my mind. So when I titled the book Zero Regrets, it was an attempt at telling the world, this is a chasing of a philosophy. This is a way to live your life, to look not only forward at the potentials that exist within you, to unlock that gold medal mindset, but also to look back and smile and remember and to know that you can't change what you had done. You can't change what was said or experienced yesterday, you can learn from them and you can grow from them. And these are part of your experience. These are chapters in your life book. And no one lives a perfect life. No one lives a champion life, so to speak. They have ups and downs and wins and losses. And I think the ones who are able to embody what we you know, would term champions or strength are those who continuously keep getting up and they reinvent and they adapt and they keep showing up on a daily basis. And that's the attempt through that book, Zero Regrets, is to get people to recognize, hey, like there's another path here. There's another choice. You don't always have to be a passenger in the life train. You can get into the driver's seat, grab a hold of the steering wheel. You can look out onto the horizon, recognize that you may not be able to control what's coming at you. How you respond and not react to those things is within your control. And it also will greatly dictate the happiness level of your life. And to know and understand that this thing that we're experiencing in our human experience is wild and it's going to be, it's going to be painful and it's going to be fun and it's going to be exciting. It's going to be challenging. I think when you have that perspective, it changes everything. And so that was the attempt is to have people start to look at their life less as a victim and more at saying, you know what, these things have happened and now I'm going to pursue a life pursuant of a zero regrets mentality. How would you describe the transition from being a full-time skater to being a civilian? That's what I'm writing about right now for my next book. That book is called Hard Pivot. It's a, <laughs> it's a hard pivot that is required. I call it the great divorce. You've loved this sole person, which is sport, your entire life. It's given you everything. It's provided the guardrails that you can unleash your anger, rage, insecurity, self-doubt, fear, and still hurdle yourself towards that goal, which is the Olympics. Because You just keep bouncing like a pinball back and forth across these guardrails. Sport provides that. It taught me about all the incredible attributes associated. And then with a snap of the fingers on day 18 of the Olympic Games, the day after closing ceremonies, you wake up and you're full-time love of your life says to you, I've found another suitor who's <laughs> younger, who's more attractive, better genetically designed, greater story, bigger sponsorship potential, more articulate in the way they speak and react, and just better than you. And there's nothing that you can do and you can no longer come back to me because you just simply are not good enough. But I don't want you to go too far because I want you to come back and I want you to come commentate. And I want you to talk about this new athlete that we're highlighting. So the great divorce is hard because you feel like, what now? What skill sets do I have that can be transferable? Now I'm 25. I'm 30 years old. I'm retired. Maybe you did or you didn't go to school. Now you're in the waiting room or you're in a Zoom waiting room trying to do an interview for a job where a 22-year-old is trying to get the same job. But that 22-year-old, you feel actually is more prepared than you are. Mm. It's a stark reality into, did you prepare for retirement? Probably not. And what do you do? How do you pivot in a way that is going to force you to reinvent yourself? Because going in circles wearing spandex is not exactly <laughs> going to help you in the corporate world. I can um, do it, but I don't get paid for it. That's I can do it. Yeah. And, you know, I mean, I think casual Fridays, there you people go. Now we have casual months and weeks now. It's a different world, man. So look, I think that the transition is perhaps the most challenging. I think that the weight of gold highlighted that in a certain perspective. I think most athletes just do not prepare. There was no resources at the time to help us prepare for that. We didn't know. People could tell us, but we didn't really feel it. It's a stark reminder that, hey, 
you better get your shit in gear. You got to get your act in gear because no one's going to feel sorry for you. And you have to figure out. And the moment that you have stagnation is the moment that you start losing. So just like in sport, you get up every day, you set your schedule, you grind, and you seek those small micro wins on a daily basis. And over time, you will start to see progress and you will change your behaviors from what was to what you will be. That's the positive side. But on the other side, it's hard, man. There's a lot of friends of mine who I've known for many years who just now, 10 years after retirement, are opening up and saying just how unhappy and lost that they are. And that's really sad to me because I'm just like, man, that's 10 years of your life where you felt like you've just been totally hiding from this person that's always been there. So I like the fact that society is being much more open and vulnerable and celebrating vulnerability in a way that says, hey, I too feel that. I too, between my ears, have those conversations. I too have had those days where I don't want to continue. And you don't have to go on that alone. So I think Olympic athletes just because of the external signaling of society and how this has been for so many years, we only celebrate champions and we also celebrate people who don't have to ask for help, right? We have always celebrated and you're taught that as an athlete where you just figure it out on your own and you have to remain strong, wear this poker face and this armor that you are indestructible and nothing can crack you and hurt you. But man, when you peel that stuff off, you're still a human being and human beings have emotions and thoughts like anybody else. Yeah, I think it's an extreme example of what most people go through, you know, you come out of college, you work for 30, 40 years, and then you retire when you're 62 or 65 or whatever it is, and you still feel young. You've got 20 plus years of life left probably, or, you know, 20 years of active life left. And you're like, okay, what now? And it's a much bigger mind bender than people have ever prepared for because they got good grades in college. They've been successful at work. And then all of a sudden the merry-go-round just stops. And it's like, okay, as you ask yourself in the book early, do you know not what you are, but who you want to be? I think you're right. I went back to school at the end of last year. I went to this Wharton Business School leadership program. Ah, you could have gone to Dartmouth, man. Come on. But okay. Yeah, (laughs) I could have. The one thing that's really interesting is we did this exercise where we had to partner up with three different people. And it would be three rounds of one minute each. One person would say to the other person, they could only say the following, who are you? And the other person would recite who they are. And that one minute takes a long time when you do that. So you would ask (laughs) me, who are you? And I would say, oh, I'm Apollo Ono. I'm an eight-time Olympic medalist. I'm this and this and this. And you would say, who are you? Who are you? Who are you? So the first session of this three rounds, everyone stated was basically on their business card. What they were there for, the position they had, what business they were in. Second session, the layer gets peeled back even further. And this is not by choice. This is just, we're just doing this exercise. People start talking less about the title, start talking more about you know, their family. And on the third session, these people start talking more about who they are, what do they like, the things they do. And it was really fascinating to me because this was four weeks into the program. I thought that I had known everybody there. There's 38 other executives who were attending this program. You know, we're living in the dorms at the Steinberg Conference Center. And I thought that I had known everybody like, you know, very, very well. And in those three minutes, I found out more about those people than I did in the prior four weeks. So I think when we figure out like who we are, who we are, not what we do, I think that's really interesting. As athletes, we also seek the same thing. We seek those areas of who am I? I always ask myself this question. What does the universe or what does the world want from Apollo? And what do I, Apollo, want from the world? And sometimes they're different answers, but I try to ask myself that often and to always make sure that I keep the main thing, the main thing. One thing you said in your book that I thought was really interesting, and I want to end our conversation right here. You said you were talking to one of your sports psychologists and you said you wanted to know not just that you were doing the right things physically, but that you were living a good life. How do you define living a good life today? Living a good life to me is one that is filled, I think, with health, with wonderful friends, with healthy family. And I think a contribution in terms of the work that I'm producing that has a positive impact on people. And that's what I'm mission driven now to do is I spent my entire first half of my life focused on Apollo, focused on me. And now I'd like to focus on how I can provide some of these insights, guidance, lessons from failure that I have faced and bridge the gap between I think Olympic champion and people who also struggle and are facing the same type of challenges. 
that to me is living a good life. One that is rich with laughter and love and happiness and less with pain. Well, Paul, this has been an awesome conversation. I appreciate your time. If somebody wants to find out more about you or to book you to speak, where can they go to find out more information? Uh, you can follow me across all social at, at Apollo Ono and on my website, ApolloOno.com. There's links to it in the show notes. And Apollo, as I'm sure everybody knows, has one L. That's right. <laughs> hey, man, thanks so much for taking the time to be a part of this. I really appreciate it. Of course. Thanks for having me. Well, that was groovy. What a fun time it was talking to Apollo Ono just a few months into quarantine. This is a new outro, by the way. It's February 2022 that I'm recording this. We know a little bit more about the world and the Winter Olympics are happening right now. So I thought it would be an appropriate time to re-release this episode. Let's talk about takeaways, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, number one, successful people don't always feel successful. So don't assume that anybody out there who's walking around with a gold medal or an important job title, apparent wealth and or fame, that they walk around feeling as if there's something better than you or other people. Sometimes that success might even confuse them. They say, well, I appear to have it all. I have everything I've ever dreamed of. So why do I not feel like I'm super important? I'm not saying you should feel sorry for successful people. I'm just saying, remember that they're human. They have the same self-doubts and fears that you do. And maybe you're one of those successful people and you know what I'm talking about. So I'll stop talking about that one. Number two, takeaway number two, the key to long-term success is that you keep going. You reinvent yourself. You deal with life's evolving circumstances. You have one door close and you open another or you find a window or something like that. I think this is underestimated. I think that I certainly felt this when I had to reinvent myself, when I got to reinvent myself seven, eight years ago, depending on when, when you start counting. But like you think that you have this goal and once you achieve it, well, the rest of your life is just going to fall into place. That's not how it works. And it's especially not how it works for athletes or artists who achieve massive fame at 25, 28, 31 years old, and then it just stops. And all of a sudden they have to say, who am I? What do I do? How do I use these gifts that I've had so far in my life or these accomplishments that I've achieved so far in my life? And how do I turn them into a meaningful back half of my life? I think that is an underestimated challenge that all of us will eventually face, hopefully, that is, that we'll live long enough and have the health-related optionality to do with our lives what we wish in the back half of our lives. But we will deal with this at retirement age when you finally leave that corporate job or when you have the opportunity to do something else. You'll still have to say, who am I? What do I do? And how do I bring my values to life every day? Number three, process, not outcomes. We talked about this a lot, so I won't dwell on it. Short track speed skating is chaos. I was surprised as I read the book that it's not always the fastest skater who wins. It's not always the one who's most has the best endurance. Sometimes it's the skater who doesn't crash that wins the race. And that's weird because you think, well, the person who trains the hardest or the person who is the fastest should always win, but that's not how it works. And long-term success in that sport means you just got to train as hard as you can and deal with whatever circumstances the race throws at you. That is much like life. Focus on the everyday. What do you do every day to prepare what do you do every day to stay healthy? What do you got to do every day to get a little bit better than you were the day before? Don't worry about what other people are doing. Get the most out of yourself. That is all. I hope you're enjoying the Winter Olympics. I hope you got a lot out of this conversation with Apollo Ono. Please take a moment to rate and share Crazy Money. You can click the link in the show notes or you can go to ratethispodcast.com slash crazy money. Ratethispodcast.com slash crazy money. If you have any thoughts for me, you want to send me a message, you want to suggest a guest, shoot me a note at paul at crazymoneypodcast.com. Paul at crazymoneypodcast.com. Go and make the most of the rest of your day.